I need to start by saying that the only qualification I have to talk uh, about Machiavelli is that I'm Italian, just like Machiavelli. <laughs> um, and um, uh, I went to school in Italy, of course, and uh, we do read Machiavelli in high school. And the only thing that I remember from learning about Machiavelli is that he, his name is spelled with one C. Uh, that's uh, really the only thing that I can remember from that. Um, and in fact, I, I'm, I'm talking to you today about Machiavelli's uh, uh, The Prince, and I didn't even read the original to prepare for this. I, I read an English translation. Uh, but you should definitely check out, um, check out the book from what's the Remnant Trust. Yes, from the Remnant Trust. And you should read the book. I found it uh, very interesting. And um, so what I'm going to do today uh, is I'm going to start talking very briefly about the author. And then I'm going to turn this into something that I am more comfortable with, which is um, talking about some economics. So I'm going to use the text from Machiavelli <coughs> to, to show you how some of his insights have been extended, whether implicitly or explicitly, uh, by some economists studying political institutions. Uh, so, okay, so Machiavelli was a Florentine man. He was born in 1469, uh, and um, he was a member of a... Um, important local family. Uh, his father was a lawyer. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> when he was a young man, he joined uh, the government, of the, the Republican government of Piero Soderini. Um, this was like a brief uh, break from the dominance of the Medici family uh, over Florentine uh, politics. Um, and um, as uh, Dr. Phillips was mentioning, that this Republican regime followed like a even shorter uh, regime that was led by a Dominican priest, a Dominican preacher, uh, who had very revolutionary ideas. And uh, partly because of that, uh, his regime lasted very, uh, very shortly. Um, after the fall of the Republican regime, so as the Medici were able to come back with the help of uh, the French army, he was briefly sent into exile. And uh, he took advantage of this vacation uh, by sort of writing both The Prince and uh, his uh, uh, commentary on the uh, discourses on Levy, um, which is another one of his, uh, uh, of his uh, main works. And um, these are foundational works, by the way, in political theory and, and political science. And so that was uh, time well spent. Uh, after this, uh, this exile, he... Uh, came back to Florence where he contributed to uh, local um, uh, politics, but more actually about like a cultural discourse. And he served as a diplomat for Florentine interests, especially in northern Italy and, and in France. Um, he died in uh, 1527 in Florence. Uh, and his two, uh, actually three of his most important works were all published posthumously, uh, possibly because of the the themes themselves, uh, as, I'll, as I'll talk about um, momentarily. So as I said, he started writing The Prince uh, during this exile in 1513. And uh, the, the book starts with a dedication to uh, um, Lorenzo de' Medici. This is not the magnificent Lorenzo de' Medici. This is another one uh, who actually never uh, was really able to, to govern Florence at all. Uh, because he died, he died relatively young, and um, again, Florence was under uh, Republican control for a significant portion of his life. But um, Machiavelli thought that um, Lorenzo de' Medici was gonna was gonna become the ruler of Florence, and he was um, using uh, kind of this uh, dedication as a, as an excuse to talk about themes related to uh, government, and especially what I would. Um, uh, described as kind of like the strategy of government, and, and especially the strategy of government by a ruler, by one ruler. Um, yes, and so as I mentioned, it was published after um, after he died. And I'm not going to talk much about the specifics of the book, mostly because uh, I'm not very qualified. Uh, but the book, uh, I, which again I encourage you to read, uh, goes through um, several case studies that are in part from Roman history and in part from uh, contemporary Italian politics, mostly, in which he basically, uh, the way that I read this book, again, as a social scientist, was 
uh, Machiavelli sets up this hypothesis about what works and what doesn't work uh, for somebody, for a ruler who wants to maintain his rule. And so he sets up this hypothesis and then he uses these case studies from history to show whether his hypothesis was falsified or not. Whether there is evidence that his hypothesis, his approach to government by ruler actually works or not. And unsurprisingly, mostly finds that he is right, that history actually confirms uh, his hypothesis. Uh, in that way, he's very much like a contemporary social scientist. Um, uh, so uh, now, of course, Machiavelli was no economist. There was no discipline of economics at the time of, of his writing. Uh, uh, but, but he, he chose to have a very acute mind for um, a sort of like implicit social scientific methodology. As I said, he has this kind of like hypothesis testing approach. Um, <clears throat> and also he identifies uh, something that political scientists do today. Uh, this kind of like, do we need, in order to test hypotheses, we need to have variation. Like we need to have variation in the circumstances under which people are acting. And so he does that all the time in this very short book, where he goes like, okay, well, let's look at um, the circumstances within which Marcus Aurelius was ruling. What were the characteristics of his personality, his knowledge, his relationship with the military? Okay, then let's look at his son. What happened to his son? What, were his, what was his personality? What was his relationship with the army? And so on and so forth. Or he does this again when he compares um, rurals, rulers from Roman history or even from Greek history with rulers from contemporary Italy. Uh, these are this other pope, uh, uh, the Duke of Milan, or even the King of France. And so, and he explains what the differences are in the context within which these rulers, these princes are acting and how the different circumstances actually play a role into whether they were successful rulers or not. And again, he never explicitly uh, say what he means by successful ruler. Like uh, I think the introduction to this specific uh, translation that I read mentions that a lot of books have been written about the principles from Machiavelli's The Prince. It's like, unfortunately, Machiavelli doesn't really list these principles at all. Um, but I think the implicit assumption here is that a ruler wants to remain a ruler. Now, why would a ruler want to remain a ruler? Well, one, there could be like some psychological uh, determinant for that. Like we don't like to lose our job. <laughs> uh, uh, but in the case of rulers, especially from Renaissance rulers, not being the ruler anymore uh, often meant not being alive anymore, uh, which, which is not great meant leaving one's home. And I don't just mean like the actual building, but like having to go into exile, uh, losing one's uh, riches. Right? It meant going from being a relatively, especially at the time, wealthy man to being poor and possibly dying of some like rather bad diseases. And so it makes sense that a ruler would want to remain a ruler, right? And so it makes sense that there would be like these uh, unstated assumption of what motivates ruler. And then that's when Machiavelli is like, if you want to remain a ruler, then you should probably follow my, my advice. And so, but as I said, uh, both Dr. Weil and Dr. Phillips are probably much better qualified to, to talk about the book per se. Uh, I'm instead gonna use it as an excuse to talk about uh, economics. Uh, so <clears throat> economics, as a discipline is just, it's one framework to study social phenomena, right? Sociology is a framework to study social phenomena. Anthropology is a framework to study social phenomena. Well, economics is its own framework, and it's a framework that is rooted on a model of human behavior. So economists are not really interested in what I am gonna buy at the grocery store tomorrow, right? We have a model of human behavior, but like economists don't care about what I, Ennio Piano, specifically will buy. We care about macro phenomena, right? We care about the price in the market for different commodities. We care about inflation, right? We care about all sorts of other things. By the way, we care about crime rates and divorce rates. Economists have studied any possible question that you may come up with 
economists have studied or will study uh, pretty soon. Okay, so that's kind of like, a, that's why other social scientists call this a economic imperialism. Uh, I, by the way, I'm a proud economic imperialist in, in that specific meaning uh, of the word. Um, so within economics, starting in the 1960s, uh, there has been developed a, a subfield called public choice theory. And by the way, the, the founder of this school of thought uh, was an MTSU graduate. Uh, he went to school at MTSU uh, uh, for college. And in fact, he's the, uh, the guy who donated, I, I believe that this is true, they donated money to the Honors College to start some of the programs that you benefit from. His name was James Buchanan also, I should say. Uh, and, uh, and James Buchanan, so he was, he was a, an economist from the University of Chicago and then uh, from the University of Virginia. He taught all over the place. And uh, he uh, wrote seminal works that kind of like jump-started his approach to, to political science where you're studying the same things that political scientists have been studying for centuries, but using this model of human behavior that economists have developed. And as an economist, I believe that that was revolutionary and allowed us to understand all sorts of things about politics and political phenomena that we previously couldn't. Um, but so the, 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 the fundamental, uh, the, the key way to understand what the, this economic model of human behavior is the pretty you know, commonsensical uh, phrase that people do the best that they can, I am doing twice, uh, people are doing the best that they can given their circumstances. So you understand whatever you see in the world, whatever social phenomenon you observe, that is the result of the participants doing the best that they can given their circumstances. Now, given that people in politics are, well, people, uh, and given that they act within circumstances, like they have circumstances within which they act that influence their behavior, then it makes sense to apply this economic approach uh, to human behavior to politics. And so here I kind of say, I was like, well, in this sense, Machiavelli was a public choice theorist. And so there is this implicit understanding of the ruler's goals, uh, which is remaining power. And there is also a deep historical understanding of their circumstances. So for instance, here it like, there's different kinds of principalities. You have hereditary principalities, republican principalities, religious principalities. You have new uh, principalities or heritage. Again, this, the distinction is like whether you inherited your uh, rule from your, from your father or from your family or whether you just uh, rise to the power by your own will uh, or by fortune, you would say. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a few uh, quotes that I took from the text. And I'm going to uh, pretend that uh, Machiavelli meant something very, very specific that can be translated into an economic argument. And I'll show you what economists have done with the same argument. And by the way, I'll show you uh, a few cases in which Machiavelli happened to, in fact, be right. And then one case in which I think he was, uh, in fact, wrong. Um, so this is Machiavellian revolutions. And this was the first time that I really was um, intrigued by, by his argument in a, in a more methodological way. He's making a, a specific claim and a specific empirical claim um, about a phenomenon, revolutions, which, you know, it's a constant of human history. Uh, and so he says, Mel will willingly change the ruler in the hope that they will fare better, a hope that leads them to take up arms against their old ruler. But in this, they are deceived, as they invariably discover, their lot under a new ruler is inevitably worse. Now, he is probably here referencing the Savonarola regime and how Savonarola took power over Piero the Unfortunate, I believe, that was his nickname, um, uh, who was a member of the, the Medici family. And Savonarola was this revolutionary figure he literally came to power because he was giving sermons at church that were of a um, utopian, or maybe that's not the right word, but like quasi-utopian democratic theocracy regime in which people could directly participate to politics in which he was bringing together both Catholic, or I should say Christian thought, 
and the Republican tradition in Florence. And uh, I didn't work very well uh, for Savonarola or for Florence. And so, in fact, their, uh, their lot under the new ruler uh, did get worse. And so they decided to change ruler once again. Um, and so why is that inevitably, he says, invariably and inevitably, what is the logic of the fact that every time people take up arms and they try to depose the regime and they set up a new regime and the new regime isn't any better and in fact is worse? Well, one of uh, James, by the way, we're not gonna go through the math, okay? <laughs> this is just, this is from the paper, uh, from the actual paper, so, but, but I'll explain the argument very briefly. Um, uh, this was an argument made by Gordon Tallock, which, uh, who just happened to be a, a colleague of James Buchanan, a very close colleague of James Buchanan. And Gordon Tallock is asking the same exact questions, like, how come that all of these revolutions end pretty terribly for, uh, for the people who they're purportedly being uh, fought on behalf of? And um, his argument is like, look, who is most likely to participate to revolutions? Okay, one hypothesis is the general public. You know, the average member of the general public. And it goes like, well, but the average member of the general public, let's say that they do come, you know, they come down from their apartment with a Molotov uh, bottle and, uh, and, and maybe like a knife, and they start fighting in the streets. What is their contribution to the actual outcome of the revolution. It, it's pretty small. In fact, the larger the revolution, the smaller the contribution. So the incentive of like the average person to contribute to a revolution, it's pretty small. So you don't really expect the general public to be both involved in revolution or to be very much interested in the revolution in the first place. The alternative hypothesis is that it's either members of the current regime who are unsatisfied with the leader of the present regime or members of an alternative faction that expect to be the ones in power. So expect to get the most out of the change in regime. I was like, well, if that is true, then it makes sense that a revolution doesn't change very much for the general public and in fact it may it may make things worse because they are mostly, I should say, to the benefit of alternative factions or uh, unhappy, disgruntled members of the present regime. And um, again, this was a very important contribution to social sciences. This one paper started a whole literature on the economics of revolutions. And it's a very basic argument that start from a very similar premise. Although Taloc wasn't thinking about Savonarola necessarily, he probably had in mind like the, 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 the Soviet revolution, for instance. Well, we get rid of the czar, because the czar is a pretty bad ruler, and the Russian regime is not a particularly well-run regime, and what we get is worse. In fact, possibly a lot worse. Uh, and so, we find, well, Machiavelli did have an interesting insight here that is uh, consistent with economic theory and for which we find a lot of evidence. And then, in the same chapter, he has an even, um, I, this one I was, I was surprised by because it's, uh, it's not something that I have encountered uh, even in economics, or it's not a common argument that is made in economics, but in fact, it has been made uh, in economics. And this is about colonies, and basically says, look, you may have a ruler, there's a heritage ruler, but that extends his control over a new area, a new region. What does this person do in order to prevent this region from revolting and from becoming independent again or from being stolen? Maybe they just, uh, as soon as a, a, a rival army uh, invades a region, the population just joins them or supports them or welcomes them with, op with open arms. Uh, well, he says they basically have two options. One is you move your regime there. You move the capital there. And then he goes, another efficient remedy to keep control of a new territory 
is to set up colonies in one or two places, they will act as shackles of your new state. If you do not set up colonies, you will have to send a, a greater number of troops to secure it, while a colony can be established and maintain a negligible cost. Now, when the United States started, they only had control of a very small part of what the United States are today, the territory of the, of the United States today. And most of what was, well, I guess, west of the Mississippi uh, was up for grab, right? So there were a lot of different groups that were interested in controlling different parts of what are today's United States west of the Mississippi. So we have like indigenous groups, of course, who live there or have been removed from their territories uh, east of the Mississippi. You have uh, Mexico, of course, which nominally controls at least, oh, controls a big chunk of the territories. Uh, we have uh, Spain, uh, of course. Uh, we have England. And by the way, you also have Russia. Apparently, there was like a Russian colony in California, and so Russia was trying to come, you know, from Alaska all the way down to California. Uh, that, of course, didn't work out. Uh, but uh, uh, the United States decided uh, that they needed to come up with a policy to discourage invasion from these other powers and establish its control of territories that it either claimed to be it or that other um, or that it had control over, but that other powers could claim back or could try to invade specifically from the south. <clears throat> And so uh, what the federal government does, it starts the, uh, it introduces the Homestead Act uh, of 1862, I believe. And the Homestead Act is basically just the establishment of colonies. And they establish colonies by saying, we have federal land, we're gonna give it to you, well, basically for free. If you stay there for a certain uh, number of years, if you cultivate that land, um, <clears throat> and after that, the land is yours. You have property of that land. And people start like running to the frontier, right? So uh, you see this in places like Texas actually had its own homestead policy because Texas land wasn't federal land. And so it was like a state run program. But in all of the other territories, you see an influx of people from the eastern states uh, starting to settle all over the plain states, for instance. So going out all the way to North Dakota uh, and all the way down to Oklahoma. Uh, Florida had its own um, program as well. Um, and so uh, Doug Allen, who's an economist at Simon Fraser University, uh, wrote uh, like a series of papers on this, uh, on this question. And he finds that in fact, that logic that Machiavelli identified was the same logic that helps us understand uh, the uh, homesteading policy by the federal government. And the reason that the federal government had to rely on these colonies was that the federal government didn't have a standing army. So the cost of sending troops was really very large, right? It was a very, very large cost. When you don't have a standing army, you can't defend your border. You cannot defend your claim over land as easily. So what can you do? Well, you have ownership over land. Why don't you just make the land free for the homesteaders? And so they are going to be willing to come in because they farm the land. They increase the value of the land to themselves. They're more willing to defend the land themselves. By the way, once an area has been... Uh, occupied, so to speak, when there's a high density of the population, it's much harder for a place like, for, for a country like Mexico, for uh, native groups to try to come and occupy it back. Because the people who are living there, I'm going to defend it, right? And so this policy, uh, which again, this is a policy, yes, like it's the 19th century, but it's pretty recent. This is a very recent example of the kind of, of, of strategy that Machiavelli was suggesting to his prince. Um, now, this is one that is, uh, what am I doing on 
on time. We want to leave like 20 minutes for 15. OK. So <clears throat> this is one that is particularly important to economists, even though I don't believe economists cite Machiavelli in this very often. Um, so Machiavelli, uh, he, this is the chapter on what the prince should do to acquire prestige. And he goes through all of these uh, uh, more like military actions or um, almost like a personality traits that a ruler, that a prince should either have or pretend to have. Um, but then there is this passage. And he goes, uh, the, he, the prince, must, take cert must make certain that his citizen can go about their, I should, it should be citizens, uh, can go about their work unhampered in trade, agriculture, and all the other professions so that no one will be afraid of accumulating possessions out of fear that they might be taken away or afraid of starting a new business for fear of taxes. Now, this is basically what economists tell you know, every government to this day. I, when economists are asked like, okay, how do you get development in the least developed countries around the world? Well, you, <laughs> you wanna incentivize production. And so how do you incentivize production? Number one, you don't want the ruler or the government to take everything from the citizens. Right? So again, take, take agriculture. Um, you have a uh, land that is very productive, but the government cannot commit not to, once all of the um, agricultural output has been introduced, to come and take it all for itself. right? And so if people know that the government may come in and take all of your stuff, then you have less of an incentive to make all of that stuff in the first place. And in fact, the less you produce, the smaller the incentive for the governments to try to come and take it in the first place. Well, now that may be you know, an efficient outcome in the sense of a, the outcome that we actually do observe in some countries in the world. But is it a, a good strategy for a ruler to survive in the long term? Or e e is it a good strategy for a ruler to acquire prestige? Uh, it's not very clear that that's, that that's a way uh, to do something like that. I mean, think of the, the regimes today that look closest to this. I mean, I'm, I, I'm thinking the North Korean regime, right? I wouldn't say the North Korean regime has very much prestige. Um, and even though it, it has survived, um, it's not a regime that survives with like high levels of economic performance or with high levels of economic development like their ne neighbors in the South. Right? Um, <clears throat> and so this intuition, by the way, uh, is the same intuition that we find in a paper by a, uh, an economist who uh, worked in political science as well, Mansur Olson. And um, Mansur Olson has this paper in which he distinguishes between a roving bandit and a stationary bandit. And basically, his all understanding of economic development over the ages is that you need to move from a roving bandit, that is a bandit that comes in, takes everybody's stuff, and then moves to the next village, to a stationary bandit. Now, he is still a bandit, but the stationarity of it, because now you have to pillage only a little bit every year, right? If you want to maintain the incentives for people to produce, you kind of are incentivized to act as if you were not a bandit at all. So the stationarity turns the bandit into almost good government, right? And, and also goes through how you go from literally bandits like stopping in one place to government providing public goods and building roads, okay? Now, you wouldn't think the bandit has very much of an interest in building roads, but if you tell the bandit, well, look, yes, you know, the village is doing well, but what if we built a road to other villages so we can have more commerce and you can tax even more? Now, maybe you keep the tax rate at the same amount, but as long as the increase in production is larger, or at least your percentage, your share of the increase in production is larger 
than the cost of building the road? It makes sense. And so these bandits are now like starting bureaucracies, professional bureaucracies, building roads and taking measurements. And that is the key to economic development. And it is the key, as uh, Machiavelli was telling us, to prestige. And so very similar intuition that, that plays a major, major role in economists' understanding of economic development and the nature of government today. Now, I told you so far, Machiavelli, perfect score, that we stop right here because Machiavelli hated mercenaries. Okay, Machiavelli uh, was actually in charge of a reform of the military system, of the military regime of Florence when he was, he was basically what we call like a, like a uh, secretary of war or secretary of defense of Florence. He was actually like, a, like the, the leader of this group of 10 people that worked on defense matters for the Republic of Florence. And Machiavelli, through his understanding of history, thought that mercenaries were a disgrace. If you hire mercenaries, almost nothing good comes out of that, okay? And so when, he, when, he, when he's uh, charged with the, the, the reform of the uh, military system of Florence, he gets rid of mercenaries and he brings back a early medieval institution that was the militia, basically conscription. Florentine citizens have an obligation, a legal obligation, to participate in military affairs. So basically, they have to own swords, they have to own horses if they can afford it, and they have to serve in the army directly, themselves. We're not gonna just get payments from them so that they don't have to serve and we hire mercenaries. No, 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 you have to actually serve in the army. Um, and his argument is, is as follows. The army with which a prince defends his state is either his own, a mercenary army, an auxiliary army, or one that is a mix of these. An auxiliary army is basically when you didn't have an army yourself, and so you went to your ally, and you asked your ally to come in with their army to basically provide you with defense services. It, it was basically, it was like for diplomatic purposes. So basically it's like instead of paying you money like you would do with a mercenary, you like, okay, and I'll support you in your battle with the Venetians in the future. Something like it. So that it was a diplomatic exchange of sorts. Florence, by the way, would do this all the time with France. We're like, friends, please come and help us. And France would come with their with their army and they would provide defense for for the for the regime in Florence. Uh, and this happened several times throughout uh, the late medieval and, and Renaissance period until the French just take over, uh, basically. Uh, which, by the way, it's what Machiavelli would have said. Uh, so, and then he goes, the mercenary and auxiliary army are useless and dangerous. A prince who holds a state that is found on the strength of mercenary armies will never be firm or secure, since such armies are divided, ambitious, without discipline, and fickle. Brave in the face of friends, cowardly in the face of enemies. Now, I have actually worked on the topic of mercenaries, and we start the paper with the quote from Machiavelli. It's like, hey, Machiavelli tells us that they're the worst. Never hire mercenaries. But over and over again, all of these principalities, city-states, uh, uh, dukedoms, and so forth, they hire mercenaries, especially in Italy, especially in the late medieval Renaissance period. Now, maybe Machiavelli is right that these are just that these princes are just wrong. They're just doing the wrong thing and they pay the price for it. But when a phenomenon, when a strategy lasts for centuries and centuries and centuries, the economists think, wait, wait a minute, why would people keep making the same mistake and not learning from their experience? To an economist, that doesn't really make sense. And so what we do in this paper is to say, wait, wait a minute. Maybe it is true that places that are mercenaries don't end up doing very well. But that the causality isn't mercenaries make places not do well, but it's places that are already not doing very well that have to hire mercenaries. And so take Florence, for instance. Florence did, in fact, have a militia system 
a conscription system until the two factions, the Guelphs and Ghibellines, emerge in the, the late 13th century and then in, 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 the, in the 14th century is the battle uh, with each other for the control of local politics. And now you can't really rely on, you cannot arm private citizens, you cannot entrust private citizens with military training because every time you do that, you're arming your potential enemies, you're training your potential enemies in military tactics that can be used against you. And by the way, it wasn't unusual for people to literally battle and fight within the cities. All of those towers, those beautiful towers that you see in a lot of Italian cities, especially in central Italy, they weren't built to have like a great view of the countryside. <laughs> they were built to find ref refuge when one of these battles would start because they would start killing each other, like one clan is killing the other clan. So they had to spend weeks barricaded in these tall buildings, basically, because they have to fit, because it was kind of like a castle within the city. And so it's not surprising then that Florence has to say, you know what, we're not gonna rely on, on our own citizens, we're gonna rely on mercenaries. And so when the Guelphs are in power, yes, they have a, a domestic infantry, they have their own militia, but for the cavalry, they have mercenaries. How come? Because the Ghibellines were the ones with the horses. They were the ones traditionally entrusted with serving in the cavalry. And vice versa, when the Ghibellines are in power, they go like, okay, well, we're gonna have the cavalry, but for the, for the infantry, we're gonna hire mercenaries. And so up to, to the point where they're like, it's illegal for Florentines to serve in the army. No Florentines in the army, we're gonna have other people come in, the Florentines have to pay for the privilege not to serve in the army, which they cannot do anyways, but we got to raise funds to, to hire mercenaries anyways. Um, and so almost a perfect score, but at least in this, I got to say Machiavelli got it wrong, um, and we got it right, of course. Well, uh, that is it. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about this book. I, so I, absolutely, I'm not. I'm not claiming at all that Machiavelli was wrong in the sense that, look, uh, there it, there may be benefits, and in fact, very large benefits to relying on domestic forces, especially for defensive purposes, right? Because especially for defensive purposes, the people from here have an incentive to defend their spot. Now, most war uh, that we're talking about, uh, in, especially for Florence, Florence was in an imperial, uh, you know, effort was was going through an imperial effort at the time of like basically controlling the entirety of Tuscany. And so they weren't fighting very many defensive wars, but you're absolutely correct. Uh, but so think of the um, post-colonial governments in Sub-Saharan Africa or even in Northern Africa. So after World War II, a lot of countries gain independence or they fight for independence. Well, we have these new regimes and these new regimes are pretty weak. Uh, especially dictatorial ones, authoritarian ones, what do they do? They hire all of these veterans from European armies to come and fight for them. And so you have all of these, like, for instance, Dutch pilots. They go and fight for these or these other, uh, yeah, for, South, for the South African uh, government, of course, but also for, like, the one of, I, I apologize, one of the Congos. I don't, I never remember which one, but, like, the, they literally had all of these uh, uh, Dutch pilots that, by the way, they would buy Dutch, like the same um, um, airplanes, military airplanes that were used by the Dutch army because they were hiring uh, the, Dutch, the Dutch mercenaries. So they're like, well, we need to, you know, like we need to have complementary of skills and, and capital here. But, uh, but yes, I, I agree that there are benefits. It's not a matter of whether the mercenaries, sorry, the domestic army has benefits, but it also has drawbacks specifically within a uh, regime that is unstable. That, that would be our argument, at least. Why Florence? That is a great question. Um, why is the American Revolution different? Well, now, I would say, I, I, I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate here, I would, Gordon Tallock would say, I was like, well, wait a minute, who gained the most from the American Revolution? Well, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, right? 
those were the new leaders of the of of the regime. Now, I don't. I'm not American myself, and I, I, I love this country. I don't want to offend anybody here. But like, the Canadians did fine, OK? I mean, like, not as great as, as America, but like in Canada, they did fine. And so if, if you were to take Talak's argument and say, it was like, OK, how much did the average American gain from the revolution, and you compare I know this is not a perfect measurement, but for instance, GDP per capita, you compare the GDP per capita of an American with that of a Canadian, you don't find very much difference there. And so he would say, well, see, that wasn't much of a benefit. That's another great question. Uh, <coughs> Australians did just fine. I'm kidding. Uh, th that is a great question. That is a great question. It is, it is entirely plausible. Like, we don't have a counterfactual in which America doesn't have independence. So that's one problem. Social scientists can't run experiments. Uh, we have to kind of rely on the data that are actually available to us. Uh, but the clothes that we have to an experiment is, uh, you know, the, the loyalists moving out to Canada and, and uh, the, the revolutionaries staying here. But you're right, maybe, maybe that changed the incentives of, of Great Britain, of, no, of, of like the English government. Um, yeah, that's a great point. And your uh, perception on how would you respond to that? <sighs> wow. Um, I was expecting a lot more deviousness in the book, uh, given, given the cultural context. Um, I mean, he does say sometimes you should, uh, at least I'm reading him this way, like you should be willing to adjust your strategy to change the circumstances that sometimes mean like betraying trust or surprising people in ways that are not going to be appreciated by them. But that doesn't seem to me to be the core of the book. And also, I was taught Machiavelli uh, as someone who was a proponent of this idea of like a unified Italy and like do we need to do anything to have a unified Italy. I, again, perhaps it's because I, I do not necessarily understand that the, the uh, the complexity or, or, or like the meaning of the text that is like beyond like or like reading between the lines, but it doesn't seem to be exactly what he's getting at. He's talking about freeing Italy from foreign interference, but he doesn't, for instance, that would mean like the Venetians stay, right? The Venetians get to keep the Venetians Republic because they're not being occupied by anybody. Uh, or the papal states get to stay and they get to stay as papal states. There is no argument there that says, and that's why we actually should have Rome as part of that. That's just not there. Um, so it, it, to me, it seems that Machiavelli is seeing the influence of foreign powers as very as having a very negative effect on the ability of domestic rule to go as it should. Basically, absence of civil war, absence of bloodshed, people having to go in exile and come back, and then the other guys have to go into exile and come back and so forth which in Florence was literally the rule. Like you had these like uh, Ghibellines like scattered all over Italy because they were kicked out of, you had the Guelphs and that they also had to, to go all over Italy. And so Dante is going like to Padova and like going around like, like serving as a, uh, kind of like a, kind of like a, a politician for hire, or like, a, a, like a diplomat for hire for all of these different places because that was like the greatest Florentine tradition Right, like that and uh, uh, no salt in the bread. Uh, right, so the, those are the two things that they do in Florence. They kicked out their enemies. But you actually gave a speech to say it's going to be very different all of a sudden what they do. That's, uh, look, uh, that is a very plausible reading. I, I, again, this is my social scientist, you know, self talking. I think he's actually making a positive claim about what kind of attitude, what kind of strategy works. Because when it comes to like normative claims, one of the rulers that he praises the strongest in the book is Marcus Aurelius, which actually has the opposite reputation, a honorable ruler. Uh, and a devious ruler like uh, his son, I, Commodus, he actually like uh, throws under the bus. It's like he was terrible. Uh, and so it doesn't seem that he has a taste for uh, deviousness or like uh, deceit, but it's more like, look, 
under certain circumstances, the prince must be willing to do this if he wants to survive. Hmm. So I, I think he has a sense of like the interest of the Florentine Republic specifically. Like I, that is the collective that he's most interested in. I don't think he cares about. He has one throwaway line about like, oh yes, and they're and they're making Naples pay taxes. Like, okay, like that's literally the first time you're saying anything about that. You don't seem particularly upset. But I think he thought that for the purposes of ruling Florence, well, the influence of foreign powers is a negative one. And so I want Florence to have a good ruler that doesn't need to rely on these. And in fact, can make Florence, can run Florence so well that foreign powers don't want to mess with it. Uh, I don't think he has a collectivist understanding of like interest like in general or even for Italy in general. I, again, and I may be wrong about it, but he also cares a lot about, and the prince is going to do great, specifically the, the individual prince. He's going to be, you know, he's going to have prestige and he's going to have all that he wants and he's going to survive. He's not going to get killed or he's not going to have to go into exile. And that makes sense if you're trying to convince somebody that they should do something, you want to combine a little bit of both. Look, you're doing something that is heroic for your quote unquote country, for your home, and you're doing something that is great for you too. Uh, you get to enjoy it, it, everything as well. It's kind of like I'm giving an ideological anchor for it, but I'm also showing you all of the benefit specifically for you and your dynasty and your house from following my, uh, my directions. Yes, I, uh, I, well, yes and no in the following sense. I think that he would say, but then if circumstances change and now you have to act the exact opposite to maintain rule, according to my principles, that you absolutely should. And then, yes, you have like act, what was the, 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 the saying they use? Yes, the problem is that you, you don't necessarily have to think just one way. You may have to think different ways at different points in time if your objective is to stay in power. I think that he would say it was like, yes, but at a metal level. There was, there's not one way. There's these kind of like dynamic way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I know that's a great point. It is like a, a strategic aspect to it as well because after the fact, people can just say, well, he had to do it to get to this point. It's not like he wants to do it. If you keep doing it, people may be confused. It's like, does he just like to kill people? Uh, it's kind of like the, the, the Michael Corleone school of strategy, right? Like, just do it in one day uh, while you're baptizing your, your sister son, I guess. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.